So the lesson today continues looking at the things that happened to Daniel and Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah. We continue to ask the question, do you love the truth? And it's intended to be an introspective that we think about ourselves and our own approach. And we look at those who fairly clearly did love the truth to see what they did and see whether we have parallels to that that indicate to ourselves that indeed we do love the truth. Today we look at leaning on God himself for mercy in time of need. Leaning, leaning on God, looking for mercy in time of need. As in, when something bad happens, when some very nasty thing seems like it is about to take place, where do you go then, and to whom do you appeal then? And where is your trust or your confidence that you will get through that? Is it in the self? <laughs> in the uh, mantras? Whatever things people use to try and cope uh, in this world? Or is it rather in God and in his word? All right. So we look over at Daniel chapter 2. Because in Daniel 2... <clears throat> excuse me, is a record of a, an, a time when the king had decided that he would destroy all the wise men in the whole kingdom. And you may remember that Daniel and the other three were all of them considered wise men in this kingdom. They are not. But they were considered wise men among all the others, so... Yeah, they're in the crosshairs. <laughs> and, uh, you know, in these days with Nebuchadnezzar, or not Nebu, uh, oh, actually it is still Nebuchadnezzar, I believe. But whatever, in these days the kings of Babylon could do things like that. Say an entire class of persons or an entire job title can be wiped out. And uh, that's what he did. He had the dream, you may recall. Nobody had an answer for the dream. Right, this is what's happening. Because there was no answer, the king was angry. Indeed, rather furious, actually. And commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. So everybody who says they are wise, everybody who is supposed to know, but does not know, say they are wise, but they are not wise, because they cannot solve this mystery He's mad at them, and they're going to be killed. And the decree goes out, decree goes out from the king in the 13th verse of Daniel chapter 2. And it's about to happen. At that time, they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. They're turned to be killed. I don't know how many have been killed at this point, but it's clear that this is serious. Now, in Daniel 2, 14, you begin to see how Daniel responds to this and how it evidences that he believes in God, he trusts God, he loves truth. In the 14th verse, he replied, with prudence and discretion to the servant, that's Arioch, captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. Others, perhaps, tried to bribe him, right, tried to talk their way out of this, tried to create a diversion and run, whatever. It's not how Daniel approached it. Instead, he replied, it says, with prudence and discretion. He declared to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree of the king so urgent? <laughs> What's the urgency behind this? And he made the matter known to Daniel, who, in the 16th, went in and requested the king appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. So the response of Daniel is to go to the king and say, you name the time, 
and we will answer this question. I didn't know you had this question is what it is. Now, why can he make this commitment? Appoint me a time, and I will appear before you as summoned and show the interpretation. How can he be so confident about that? How can he commit to a timeline, to a schedule, to a precise appointment even? How can he make that commitment? Well, the confidence he has is not within himself. He does not believe that he is going to figure out what the king's dream is and means and have that presentation ready for the king at a moment's notice. That would be foolish. Confidence poorly placed. Rather, his confidence is in God. He relies on God. He knows that God doesn't want him dead. And he knows that God can use this for his own glory, for his own purpose. He's confident when he commits to, you set a time, I will show up. Because he knows that the rest of that is, and God will tell you what the dream means. So his commitment, his trust, his reliability that allows him to schedule, that allows him to appoint, is not internal. It's external. It's God. And this is why, um, you know, this is why we ask again the question that we asked, do you seek mercy from God? <laughs> Is God where you go when you need help, when you need mercy, uh, when you realize that you cannot rely on your own strength or ability? Where do you go then? The book captures many times that the kings of Israel went to foreign kings and foreign nations for backup and support, for resources that the kings made alliances with foreign kings, marrying into their families. What is that called today? It's called keeping the door open. Right? Not burning bridges. We, we, we just need to communicate together. Well, how can I have peace with them if I can't talk to them? This is the language of compromise, friend. That's compromise. You hear that? That's not somebody who knows that they do not actually have a need because they rely on a God who can supply every need. Do you seek your mercy from God or from men, right? Do you seek your mercy from truth in God's word? Or do you seek it rather from whatever? Alliances, you know, protocols. Where is your confidence? Where is your reliance? Where do you turn when you need help? That's what it's about. Because that tells you whether you love the truth. That, zooming all the way back out, that's the question is, do I love the truth? And I can see in this instance whether that is the case. Well, moving on to Daniel 2, we go to 17. He went to his own house and made known the matter to the others, his companions. His instructions to them in the 18th verse are, Seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery. Remember, he's already made the appointment. He went to the king directly. The king's matter is urgent. Here's the matter. Where does he go? He goes direct to the king. Remember what Jesus said? Settle with your accuser on the way. Lest the judge put you in jail. It's important to settle, to go direct when you have a problem. And this is true for business as well. Senior manager is now talking. 
but that's true. You, you got a problem between people or between organizations. You know, organizations don't exist. There are people. <laughs> Who represents the interest of that organization? Go talk to that person. You have to. And Jesus said it as well. Reconcile with your adversary on the road. Don't get to the arbitration. Don't go there. Daniel went direct to the king and made an, a commitment. You set the time and I'll be there. Then he comes home. Then he talks to his friends and lets them in on, well, here's what's happened. And I've committed. There is a time set. Therefore, what? Well, quick, make some notes. Put together some slides. <laughs> no, no. What do you do now? Now, seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery. Why? So that Daniel and the rest may not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Yeah, let the false teachers be destroyed. That's not my concern. But for Daniel and for my friends... Let the Lord God of heaven deliver us. We rely, we rely on God. We seek mercy from God. So he goes in. He's confident. And his confidence is well placed. God can deliver them. It's not testing God. Nineteenth verse. The mystery then was in fact revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. So... Presumably that night, or at least, I don't know, when the appointment, the appointment was set, was, was there days in between? It doesn't say. But at some point, their prayers to God are answered, and it is revealed to Daniel. And Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Which is to say, he turned back and said that God was good. He realized that he was right to put his trust into God. He was right to rely on God to supply the need and gave thanks. As we mentioned earlier, thanksgiving is always in order. Well, I'm skipping over the part about the dream because that's not the important part. <laughs> for today's purposes, for today's lesson, that's not the important part. The important part is God gave it to him he came at the appointed time, and he delivered them. Daniel did. 48th verse, the king, at the end of this, when Daniel has interpreted the dream accurately, and by the way, he did not say, I know what the dream says. He said, God knows what the dream says. It's not in Daniel, it's the Lord God who answers this for you. I maybe should have put those verses in there, but you know, if you've read it, Daniel doesn't take the credit here. The king gave Daniel high honors in the 48th verse. So at the other end, after it has been solved, and the king understands that Daniel is right about this, Daniel gets high honors and great gifts, and Daniel also becomes ruler over the entire province of Babylon, chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. That's an interesting thing, don't you think? This one who interprets the, the dream of the king. The king was angry. The king had a decree to kill the wise men. And I would say a righteous decree. From my reading of this, that was a righteous decree because they said they were wise. They said they knew and spoke for God, but they didn't. So they rightly would have been put to death. Daniel, though, he is actually wise, he and his friends, and they do actually listen to God, and God does use them to speak. So he approaches the king and appoints a time because his confidence is in that God and in his salvation, which God has given him. And he does interpret the dream according to what God told him to say, giving God the appropriate credit. Okay, looked like he was going to die, he and his friends, but not so. He didn't. He comes back from the dead, if you will, and testifies to the king. 
who realizes this is truth. This is real. And therefore, accords Daniel, high honors, great gifts, but more than that, authority. He's the ruler over the province, the entire province of Babylon. That is really interesting because Babylon, you know, took Judah. Babylon took Assyria, which had taken Israel. Babylon took a whole bunch of other things too. It was huge. And all these kingdoms of the world, not all kingdoms of the world, planet Earth, but everything in the ancient Near East anyway, became Babylonian. And where the people were perhaps minded to think that this is our enemy, and uh, if only we had the strength to fight back, if only we had the soldiers, the chariots, the technology, we might have repelled this threat. Not so. Look what God did. <laughs> Isn't it better? Look what God did. They didn't repel the threat of, of Babylon. They now rule Babylon and everything Babylon conquered. Was it by sword and shield? Was it by bow and arrow? Was it by chariots and horses? No, it was not. It was by faith. They trusted God. They relied on God and God delivered them and handed their enemies over. He ruled the entire province. He ruled all the, the wise men too. Joseph was given command over everything in Egypt, remember? Who also was able to interpret a dream and use it to bring about the salvation not only of Egypt, but all the ancient Near East. And he also was made second in command. God does things like that. What does Daniel use that authority for? Well, he does have a request from the king. And you can imagine this. I mean, he has solved the mystery. He has told the king what is about to happen, and the king has given him large gifts and made him ruler of the province. As in, I'm outsourcing my governance to you. I'm going to be king and do king things and eat king food, but you are going to do the work, <laughs> which is fine. He is a slave after all, a resident alien at best. But the king, no doubt, replied to Daniel, right? Daniel makes a request, and the king said, you have a request. You know, I've given you great gifts. I've made you a ruler. You've asked for nothing. Now you have a request. What is it, my son? Tell me. All I'm asking is that you appoint, these are the uh, Babylonian names for the three friends of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, over the affairs of the province of Babylon, so I don't want to do this by myself. Can I have these three? Yep, easy, done. It's your province, do what you want. I've delegated that authority to you. Right? Daniel remained at the king's court, though, where no doubt he did a lot of good things. In fact, you can read the rest of that. Now, let's look at this, too. In Daniel chapter 6, we have a handful of verses, just 1 through 5. And we're still asking the question, do you seek mercy from God? Where do you go in time of need? Right? Do you seek mercy from God? But it's connected to Daniel 2, especially the end of Daniel 2, where he is appointed the ruler. He and the other three. Another king, I think this is number three, 
it might be number four. I kind of lost count, but I think we went from Nebuchadnezzar to another guy who saw the writing on the wall to Darius. <clears throat> and Darius decided, Daniel 6, 1, to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be throughout the entire kingdom. So it's a different administration. We're going to reorganize, which is, you know, what you do. Um, when I worked at UT, I mean, it was the most reliable product of quarter one every year was a reorg. <laughs> That's what we did. <laughs> I remember when my team made, <laughs> when, my, when my team cut out all the uh, nameplates to make a magnetic one over the department name so they could just swap that out. <laughs> Keep the nameplate and their fancy name, but just swap the department, which I thought was very funny. And of course, my directors did not think was funny which made it even funnier. <laughs> well, you don't like it, then do something about it. Maybe you should have fewer reorganizations. Maybe you should accept criticism. You might get better. If you're trying to get better, are you trying to get better? Or do you just want no dissension? Because you're not going to get that <laughs> without being a totalitarian. Daniel 6.2 Three persons are over him. Reorganizations happen. Darius comes in. He's got a different idea of how to do this. Okay, that's fine. So the satraps now report to three of whom Daniel is one. Make sure the king suffers no loss, as in, I think that people's accounting is not good. My coffers are not growing. There's too much fat. There's too much bureaucracy. That's what that means. Third verse, Daniel becomes distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. When we say excellent, we don't mean excellent like Bill and Ted, cool or great, meaning his spirit excelled. It was better than every other spirit. That's because the others were either human, mere human spirits, as in what people thought and could do of their own strength, or they were demonic. But the Spirit of God is with Daniel. Not that he has the Spirit of God or is the incarnate Word of God. That's not what we're saying. But God is with him and God blesses him and God answers things for him and his prayers. So he does have a spirit that excels. His spirit is better. And that is clear to the administration and to the king. That's all we're saying. He's distinguished above all the others because there's something in him that is a lot better. And so the king was planning to set him over the entire kingdom, a plan which has been put into place before by previous administrations. And really, you can't fault Darius. Uh, again, I, sorry, I'm, I just have senior manager on the brain. I'm sorry. I was thinking about something earlier this week. But uh, again, from the perspective of that kind of organizational oversight, you can't blame Darius for saying, we're going to shake things up. The next layer is going to be kind of fat because he probably was thinking to himself, the cream will rise and I'll appoint them. That's probably what he's doing. I will see who flourishes and who does poorly. Given the same resources, who makes the best return here? And those are the ones I will make the lieutenants. Okay, to be fair, that's likely what he is doing. That's what most of the time they're looking for. Which is why when you are a Christian, you're the best employee. Not because you have miraculous power of God to solve problems at work, but because you are honest, you are trustworthy, you are hardworking whether people are watching or not. And managers know that. It's very clear who does things and who does not do things. Maybe not in a week or a month. But it becomes clear. And when you are a Christian, you're the last one they let go because you're one of the best people here. We can trust you. We can talk to you. You, you're, you, know, you care about us. You're, you're a fiduciary partner with us, not trying to get something out of it or abscond with things. Right? Christians are the best employees. All right. So this thing happening in Daniel 6.3, it's not miraculous. It's not unusual. 
the king sees it. Yeah, he's doing a lot better than everybody. He's going to be the one we put in charge. Of course. Fourth verse, high officials and satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against him regarding the kingdom, but they couldn't find ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful. Faithful to the king? Well, yes, but faithful to God. You're faithful to the boss, not because the boss is great, although I hope your boss is great, but they may not be. Not all bosses are good at what they do. Not all of them are reasonable. You never know. But you're faithful to God, and because you're faithful to God, you work, and you work honestly and fairly. So when they look for a ground for complaint, trying to get trumped-up charges against him, there aren't any. He's not breaking rules. He's not stealing or pilfering. He's not cutting corners. There's nothing wrong with this service. They could find no ground for complaint or any fault. He was faithful. No error, no fault was found in him. He was, not, he was neither wandering away, doing something else, nor failing to accomplish things that were rightfully his responsibility, right? No, this guy is actually good. There is no complaint here. In fact, he's commendable. And then they said, well, we will find no complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. <laughs> yes, because he's principled. I'm sorry, Nico, I, I can't right now. <laughs> He's principled. We'll find no ground for complaint against him and unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. Is there some way that we can cause policy to shift or to change to make Daniel do something that is contrary to the law of his God? Then he'll have to choose between the kingdom and and his religion. That's how it works. It has always worked that way. That's what will happen. Again, when I was a manager, I remember there was a, um, one of the departmental celebrations was, uh, well, in theory, it was a, 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 a cookie bake. But the point of it was that you would bring your, your cookies to this bar that was right there next to campus. Everybody's meeting at about 5.30 at this bar. And the cookies are there, too, to help, you know, buffer the other things that people were doing. And it was encouraged and themed for those cookies to have, you know, significant alcoholic content themselves. Uh, that was the theme of the Bake Off, right? So this was a thing they did that was supposed to be a celebration, a team building, whatever, you know, blah, 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 blah. And hopefully that doesn't happen to you. Hopefully you work with people who do not drink, et cetera, et cetera. But there's no telling is all I'm saying. And I'm not complaining about it either. I'm just saying that really did happen. And so then, <laughs> Zamora, we don't have your RSVP. I'm like, no, you don't. I'm not going. <laughs> Well, why not? Because I don't drink. Well, you don't have to drink. Like, I don't approve of drinking. Oh, well, it's just celebrating the team. Like, I celebrate the team. I'm, I'm happy for that. And I'm glad to send some cookies. <laughs> you don't probably want to eat my cookies, but I'll send them, you know. But I, I know I'm not going to go to a bar. I'm not going to join a drinking party. Not going to do it. It was a little bit of a fight, but I got there. I was excused. But then, of course, Satan doesn't stop, right? Because then one of my employees behaved badly at that party. And that's my fault, because I wasn't there to police it, you see. <laughs> they will find no ground for complaint unless it's in connection with the law of God. And this is always what Satan does. He's going to try to force you <laughs> to choose between, you know, Material, like your, your, li your living, your livelihood. I mean, not, not, not materialism, not greed. There's nothing wrong with working. We've said before, everybody has to eat. You need money. 
It's okay to make money. It's okay to eat. It's okay to make a lot of money and to eat well, so long as you give to God as you prosper. When you get a raise, God gets a raise. When you get a windfall, God gets a windfall. That's fine. And if you keep doing that, uh, maybe you'll see more of them. If God sees that you're faithful in a little, maybe you can be faithful in much too. I don't know. But the complaints are going to come in connection with the law. If Satan can wedge between you and your job, or between you and your government, or you and your neighborhood, neighborhood association, neighbors, family, friends, whatever earthly ties you need for physical needs here on earth, if he can get those between you and what God wants you to do, that is absolutely what he will do every time. So you've got to be strong. You have to anticipate that this is the playbook. You know, when you become a Christian, that's the game you signed up for. That's the playbook. This is what is going to happen, whether you realize it or not. I think it's good that we don't realize when we're first starting what all the costs are going to be. <laughs> and don't ask about what's going to happen tomorrow. You don't want to know. <laughs> don't ask. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. It's good that we don't know all the bad things that are going to happen, because you'd never get into it if you knew. <laughs> but it's worth it. Do you seek mercy from God? Because that's a good sign that you love the truth. You're principled. Your principles are so sound that the strategy becomes to leverage your principles against you. I still remember Groucho. These are my principles. If you don't like them, I have others. <laughs> compromise, compromise. No, that's not true. When you are a Christian, no, you don't have other principles. God is your principle, and you are faithful until death. Are you a Christian today? Become a Christian, because God will deliver you. You see that Daniel and his friends were safe. You see that Daniel saved not only himself and his friends, but also the other wise men and, and people who had been appointed in places. Although they were made subject to him, they had to learn from him, they had to take direction from him. But he also saved the people, don't you know? When Daniel is the ruler, do you think he's signing any orders? to execute Jews, to round them up? No, he's not doing that. Daniel saved many people alive by his faith, by his strength, by his love of truth, his principle, and his reliance on God for mercy in time of help and in time of need. You can do the same by being a Christian. Jesus is much better than Daniel. As great as Daniel is, Jesus is better. He is perfection. He is God in the flesh. He doesn't just have an excellent spirit. He is the spirit of God in a body of flesh. <laughs> His character is better. His perfection is real. Not that Daniel wasn't good, but he was not perfect. He was not the Savior. If that which had, uh, was perfect had been available, there'd no need be for the law of Christ to come into the world. But it's not the case. Jesus is the Savior. Today, do you believe in Jesus, that he is the Son of God? Do you want to put all that trust in God and realize that you can do so very reasonably and that he will deliver you? Well, repent of your former life. Give yourself to God from now on. Make a permanent change to be his, to trust in him, and be buried together with him in baptism, putting to death the old person of sin, burying that person in water. You are raised from the water, just as the dry ground appeared from the watery deep in the creation. Suddenly, there's something new here, and that's right. You are a Christian. 
you are clean, washed in the blood of the Lamb, free of sin, at least for a moment. I hope a lot longer. And it's a wonderful thing. There's nothing better in this world than to be a Christian. There's nothing better than to have the mind guarded by the knowledge of salvation, that you can appeal to God and he will help. You will be able to, bur to bear the burdens that come your way. You don't know what they are, and you don't want to know what they are either. But with God, you'll be able to handle it. Jesus said, Come to me, all who are heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you. A yoke is a two-animal harness. He's not putting you out front to pull him, you know, like a pedicab or something. He says, I will team up with you to pull this load, which is too heavy for you to pull by yourself. That's what that means. That's what God does. If you become a Christian, are you a Christian who hasn't lived right? Repent, make things right with God, as you know, in your prayer, but let us pray with you too, because we need help. There's no way you're the only person who's been tempted by that thing or who has faced that pressure. We all need the same prayer. So if you need to obey the gospel, you need the prayers of the saints, let it be known by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected.